Good evening, friends. Thank you very much for taking the time and for joining us for the international webinar series jointly hosted by CAHO and the International Society for Quality ISQUA. It's indeed our pleasure to welcome all of you for the webinar series. And we have an excellent speaker with us today, Dr. Henning. And to moderate the session, we have Dr. Naveen Chitkara. We introduce the moderator for the day, Dr. Naveen Chitkara. Dr. Naveen Chitkara is a neurosurgeon by profession. He runs his own hospital and a great friend of Kaho. He's the director of the NHS hospital, Jalanda. He's a technology person himself. And he's been a great supporter of Kaho in promoting the journey of Kaho, quality, patient safety, and accreditation in his region. Really appreciate Dr. Naveen Chitkara for the excellent leadership he is exhibiting as a clinician towards patient safety and quality. So let me hand over to Dr. Naveen Chitkara. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Lalu, for such a, a nice introduction of me. But the person whom I am going to introduce is no less a champion in the international forum. The topic which he is going to speak on is something which is, I would not say burning. It is something which is the future is coming to us today. Uh, as it could be rightly said that coming years are the times when technology is going to take over the human interface in our healthcare management of the patients. May it be administration of the hospital or may it be the technology coming in to improve the results in the patients. So I have my privilege to introduce Professor Henning Boy Anderson, who is a professor emeritus for Department of Technology Management Economics at Technological University of Denmark. He originally has been educated in philosophy and logic from Copenhagen University in 1976. His research, his research has focused on human factors in safety and critical domains. He had been a co-leader and primary author for recommendations to the Ministry of Health to prepare the Danish law on patient safety in 2013 which was the first national system of non-punitive mandatory reporting of medical errors. He was the first chairperson of Danish Research Network on Patient Safety and Quality, and also the chairperson for Society for Simulation and Safety in Transport. He has been a board member for Engineering Society and Risk Analysis, and his most recent work is on analyzing healthcare system resilience ethical behavior between privacy and duty of care in telehealth and sensor-based home monitoring and development of framework for responsible development use of artificial intelligence in, intelligence in healthcare. I think it will be a very interesting topic to, lead, to, to hear from the master himself. So over to Professor Henning for this wonderful talk which I'm anticipating. Thank you very much for your generous introduction uh, and I'm very honored to be invited to talk to you and um, I now present my other my next slide and uh, today's talk is from a small cold country in northwestern Europe um, I could just mention the basic features of the Danish healthcare system that is its universal coverage tax-based financing free and equal access, high degree of digitalization, and has a lot of problems. Uh, but we try to learn from incidents, and uh, more recently, we also try to learn from excellence. So we have to try, strike a balance between learning from the negative and the learning from the positive. Um, I should declare my incompetence immediately because I, unfortunately I'm not a clinical scientist nor am I a computer scientist and I'm going to talk about clinical things and computer science so really uh, my own uh, my only real competence is way back when I was a philosopher and teaching uh, philosophy of science and medical ethics to students in between in the most recent decades I've been an engineering professor so I've been working very much as uh, the introduction told you on um, safety matters, safety management. Um, now to my talk here. This is what to expect in this talk. I'll have a partial and spotty overview 
of machine learning based algorithms for healthcare. I'll give you some examples of biased or unfair algorithmic classification of patients. And I'll mention uh, uh, some formal approaches to handling bias and unfairness. And then finally, I'll uh, slide into philosophical principles underlying uh, many of these endeavors to control fairness. And I'll give example of uh, hard choices, and I'll take the recent example of triaging on the scarce resources, where I've also been following the COVID, um, the COVID the infection in India, and we have had the same uh, extreme challenges. Um, and then finally, I will mention this uh, growing interest in and growing attention to the principles of AI uh, ethics, trustworthy AI. I thought that was done before. Then you didn't even see my Europe card. That's it. There we are. <laughs> Denmark up there in the middle of Europe, northwestern Europe. Anyway, this is what to expect. And then what not to expect. I'm not going to talk about this other large group of issues, misinformation, biases, and discrimination in algorithms used by social media. Um, so here's an example of what I'm not going to talk about. Um, here's social media misinformation and biases and discrimination, an example from 2016, where um, uh, searches in Google for three black teenagers and three white teenagers gave strikingly different examples, simply because this is what people had been finding. So uh, this was, of course, an embarrassment. And um, so um, this was then annulled. But we have many, many of these examples. However, again, I'm not going to talk about social media uh, biases and discrimination. I want rather to go uh, to uh, healthcare examples. Um, as was also said in the introduction, AI is increasingly improving uh, and uh, invading also healthcare. It's improving diagnosis and clinical care, as they said in this uh, report from WHO. Um, at the same time, artificial intelligence may change the practice of medicine, increasing efficiency and accuracy of diagnosis especially in uh, specialties that rely on imaging, such as radiology and pathology. But it's also noticed by several that algorithms can underperform when they leave their home hospital and the, the patient selection. Um, now, biased algorithms that I'm going to talk about are mainly or are exclusively classification uh, algorithms. And here we have a number of examples that have come up in recent years, and they have all been published in, uh, most of them have been published in high quality journals, actually, and then also in the trade press. So, for instance, here from Nature Medicine recently, on the diagnosis bias of artificial intelligence algorithms applied to chest radiographs in underserved patient populations. Same, oops. The uh, World Economic Forum also has highlighted, so such as also Physics World. Then there was this um, disturbing um, news about racists in the machine, where it turned out that uh, the Google uh, labeling uh, gave uh, black faces a label of uh, being uh, gorillas and uh, things like that. Now, this is being addressed in many forums, for instance, also here, the Forbes Forum, where I show there, for women talking about it. Um, so there's great attention to it. And in fact, when you look up fairness in machine learning on Google uh, Scholar, you'll find a small score of papers uh, five, seven years ago, 
but now within the last two years, it's almost 2000. So it has, the attention to it has really risen. Um, here's a cartoon from the Danish medical uh, daily, Dagens Medicine, where it is quite easy to spot the bias. Here, there is a pregnant woman and her husband sitting there and the doctor says, I'll just prescribe something for you. We don't know how it affects pregnancy, but it has been tested on 10,000 white males. So therefore, rest assured, you can take it. Um, here's an example um, from 2019 in Nature, where they report that millions of black people are affected by racial bias in healthcare algorithms. Here it turned out that um, people who were black and who identified themselves as black were generally assigned lower risk scores than equally sick white people. Um, and the reason why this had happened was that the data, they were quite, um, they were quite representative, but they represented black people um having fewer visits to hospitals simply because when they were ill they didn't go to hospitals nearly as much as the white people so black patients spent one thousand eight hundred dollars less per month in medical costs per year simply because of their circumstances so this led to the algorithms concluding incorrectly that the black patients must be healthier since they spend less on health care this was, um, of course, uh, called a scandal, and it was a, an algorithm that was used widely in U.S. hospitals to allocate health care to patients. Um, let's ask about what biases are. If we, bias, of course, is a skewness, so it has been used, this term and the concept, to describe statistical uh, skewness and uh, also in uh, navigation. But the more recent uh, understanding of or use of the term uh, concept bias actually came uh, in the 70s, 90s, and especially this uh, extremely influential book called uh, Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics and Biases by Kahneman, Slovich and Tversky. Kahneman is a subsequently received the Nobel Prize in economics. It has quite a number of citations. And it introduced a rich research program of the study of heuristics and biases that people use when we make decisions under limited uh, information, limited resources, limited time. And uh, the authors introduced a number of biases, uh, described them, heuristics, actually, they are. Uh, so they are, the I list a few of them, confirmation bias, hindsight bias, self-serving bias, anchoring bias, availability bias. And um, a number of books have also described the biases in medical reasoning. There's a German author, Gigerenzer, who has uh, described that uh, in a number of publications. It is ironic that uh, prejudice and discrimination actually are inevitable, inevitable byproducts of heuristics and, and biases, namely the efficiency of human cognition. Because if we had to calculate everything in detail, we wouldn't be able to uh, be effective. <clears throat> The, it's interesting also to see that this uh, extremely influential, the most influential, um, I think, book in um, cognitive psychology is Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow that came out about a decade ago, which also has a lot of uh, citations. Um, on the other hand, biases are not only uh, we could say innocent uh, cognitive ones they're also social conscious and unconscious so for instance if we look up the definition of bias 
there's inclination or prejudice for or against one person or group, especially in a way considered unfair. There's a beautiful small paper, short paper on unconscious bias by Professor Uta Fritz in London uh, about unconscious bias in medicine, which I've just highlighted here. When we talk about the biases and discrimination, um, it is nearly always with respect to groups that are vulnerable or in some sense are, are suffering from discrimination and uh, or where it is, um, um, I would say, um, touchy subjects. So here we list uh, the attributes that are often cited as requiring bias evaluation, gender, of course, ethnicity, religion, age, marital status, socioeconomic circumstances or disability status, ability status. And um, actually the European Union's chapter of fundamental rights uh, extend the protected attributes by mentioning not only gender, race, color, ethnic or social origin, genetic characteristics, also language, religion, belief, political membership, national minorities, properties, birth, disability, age, or sexual orientation. Um, now I'm going to talk, I'm going now to talk about um, ways or attempts to control it uh, formally in computer science and machine learning. I'm going to present um, three principles for uh, for achieving fairness in machine learning. The first one is uh, called independence or demographic parity, has a lot of other names also. It really means that um, the proportion of each segment of a protected class, such as gender, low income, or whatever, should receive the positive outcomes at equal rate as the non-protected ones. So if we look here at the, uh, the graphics I have here, we have here a score on the y-axis, then we have group A and group B, group B being the protected um, attribute. And here we see that um, the uh, dotted line is the threshold. So we have uh, here four out of eight in group A, that are above the threshold, so they are allocated to treatment. And then uh, we see also here that uh, in uh, group B, we are above the uh, threshold. So we have four out of eight, four out of eight, fifty percent. So the positive outcome is we have them allocated to treatment. The limitations, of course, are that they may result in discrimination against equally eligible treatment needing individuals. I mean, there is another principle for that seeks to achieve fairness, it's separation. Here we require that the true positive rate and the false positive rate must be equal. That means also that the false negative rate and the true negative rates are equal. So here we have, of course, here we have the actual class, the predicted class, then we have the usual confusion matrix, true positive above and false positive below, false negatives and true negatives. So again, patients are assigned only after score, independent of gender, age, and people with higher survival rate are more likely to get assigned. So again, here we have a limitation that we may ignore pre-existing inequalities. Then um, the third principle is uh, sufficiency. Here we require both negative and positive parity must be achieved. It's also called predictive rate parity. So example here is among all treatment allocated patients, 
the same proportion of qualified patients by positive parity is achieved, while the same proportion of non qualitative patients is denied in the sensitive group. So here's we have a limitation because it ignores pre existing inequality among candidates. I give an example here. For instance, uh, we have in group A 100 candidate patients and 58 are qualified while group b has also 100 patients but only has two qualified patients but then if we use our sufficiency aligned algorithm and allocate we only have 30 um, we have a scarce supply of treatment slots so we only have only 30 slots and we allocate 30 patients to these 30 slots then we have secured equality of opportunity but 29 offers are now given to group A, while only one offer is given to group B. So uh, we ignore pre-existing inequalities. Here uh, is a, um, is a list of the different uh, names for the, th the, the three groups of uh, um, principles for uh, handling um, unfairness in machine learning independent separation and sufficiency and you can see they have uh, various names in there the uh, article i took this from also has references to where it has been where it is being discussed the uh, paper by barocas um let's let's go and uh, let's let's try and see what are the ethical principles uh, that could be applied and that could guide us in uh, selecting and applying um, criteria for handling fairness. Uh, there is a uh, well-known book by Chivers and Beecham or Beauchamp uh, about medical ethics and they have uh, these four, the four left ones here, beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, self-determination, and justice and fairness. These are the four principles that they have described and it's been quoted very much, but they are not. So these are the prior traditional bioethics principles. But uh, in addition, we must have uh, a new principle here we call it explicability, it could also be transparency or uh, even, uh, 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 even uh, uh, transparency and uncertainty management, govern, uh, govern, uh, governance, uh, which I'm going to talk about later here. This is from Floridian Carls. So let's have a look at these uh, fairness principles that underlie. Oh, sorry. Yes, I should. I forgot to say this. This is important. <laughs> I uh, this is that the 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 three principles that we now discussed: um, independence, uh, sufficiency, uh, they are uh, and separation. They cannot be achieved uh, simultaneously. The there is something called the impossible theorem or the impossibility theorem in machine learning. No more than one of the three fairness metrics can be achieved at the same time so this is an important um, point and uh, this reminds us perhaps of uh, kenneth arrow who had a similar but quite different uh, impossibility theorem where we where he proved that no clear order of preferences can uh, be determined uh, that uh, gives us uh, fair voting procedures i.e. this is the impossibility of having an ideal voting structure. So here again, we have the impossibility of having an ideal, fair, um, formal principle of fairness. Uh, now I go to um, reviewing um, some main ethical principles of fairness that can guide us uh, uh, when we try to regulate um, the development and uh, deployment of uh, uh, algorithms for sorting patients. The, uh, there are variations of these, but I mentioned here the four uh, major ones. 
One, the first one is treating like cases alike. This is, seems to be self-evident and it harks back for thousands of years to actually to the Greek philosopher Aristotle. Then there's another one, which is um, of more recent date. Uh, it is about ensuring equal opportunity. I'm going to describe each of these uh, in the following slides, but this is from the American philosopher John Rawls, uh, who was perhaps the most influential philosopher in the previous century, uh, especially uh, indefinitely in ethics and political philosophy. The third one is a, a, um, a, a sharpening of Rawls. It is about ensuring, again, equal opportunity by compensating for luck of any adverse circumstances or any adverse um, uh, outcome that we may uh, suffer and it seeks to establish a level playing field. And then finally, there is this hard-nosed libertarian uh, attitude, namely that healthcare benefits are fairly distributed if they're based on voluntary transactions. That I'm, I'm going to uh, analyze and describe each of them. So this first principle about treating like cases alike, it's also called consistency. It's actually an example of what has been called supervenience principle. There can be no ethical ground for providing care to one person and not to another without there being some relevant empirical difference between them, i.e. physical or psychological. This uh, supervenience uh, is a phenomenon known from philosophy that uh, also from aesthetics and uh, especially uh, ethics say that we cannot say this act is good, the other act is not good without having some physical difference. There must be some observable empirical difference. You can't say the two acts are known observable aspects the same. And then one is good and the other is not good. Uh, the same for uh, aesthetic judgments. So if two persons are alike in all relevant attributes, then treat, treating them different is simply unfair and it's inconsistent. So there can be no difference in merit or desert without some factual difference. Deserving of care is an ethical property that, so to speak, supervenes on empirical evidence or attributes. Then uh, we have um, Rawls' uh, fairness um, vision. That is fairness as ensuring equal opportunity. This was um, published uh, 50 years ago in his major work, Justice as Fairness, which is about substantive, substantive equality of opportunity. So this is what his this uh, egalitarian liberalism is about. He has two justice principles. One, the first one is liberty. Each person has an equal claim to a fully adequate scheme of equal basic rights and liberties, he says. I'm not going much into that, but then let's go to the second one is equality. He uh, uh, suggests that we must have fair equality of opportunity, as he, as he called it. All offices and positions must be open to all under fair equality of opportunity. And then this equality has another one that it can be modified, this uh, equal opportunity. That is, that if we, we are, we are, uh, perfectly allowed to have unequal treat, uh, treatment or distributions of goods if and only if they benefit the least advantaged the most. So this is called the maxi, maximin principle, maximizing the minimal. And John Rawls, he uh, believes that these principles will be uh, agreed on by anyone uh, who wouldn't know counterfactually her or his position in society. 
if we try to make this um, imagine this game that we are sitting behind a veil of ignorance i've illustrated this to the right down here we are sitting behind a veil of ignorance and we don't know where we shall end up in society whether which abilities we will have where we were born who will our parents be what what type of society would we like to get into how would how, how should society be uh, structured and arranged what um, what principles of justice should rule it he thinks that if we do this from this veil behind this veil of ignorance we would uh, arrive at his justice principles then uh, we have a sharpening of uh, Rawls' position which is fairness as equal opportunity where we compensate we seek to compensate for any and all brute unlock of any adverse circumstances it's also called log egalitarianism it goes further than Rawls in seeking to compensate for differences in circumstances over which the individual has no influence at all gender parents wealth birthplace disabilities talents etc so luck egalitarianism demands that people's benefits should be de determined only by their choice but not by differences in the circumstances they have no influence on so this has also a lot of uh, intuitive appeal it is that if we cannot uh, we have no influence of these uh, issues then why should um, our access to treatment and benefits be dependent on them then we have a stark opposite um, uh, view ethical view namely libertarianism which holds that all goods including healthcare benefits are fairly distributed if they're based on voluntary transactions. So society must respect each citizen's unconditional ownership of themselves and their labor. They also claim that distribution of goods and healthcare benefits occurs as a result of voluntary exchange among citizens. So there's little attention to issues of public utility or to addressing balanced healthcare across the population. So this uh, ethical stance uh, puts an extreme weight on freedom and liberty. So if there, there are initial gaps that could exist due to historical discrimination or social determinants, it's really out of the scope in uh, libertarianism. And the most libertarians would actually hold that there is, there is no right to healthcare. You can, uh, I mean, most uh, rational people, they say, will try to uh, uh, engage, oops, will uh, try to um, get into arrangements with healthcare um, uh, insurances, insurance, or perhaps uh, so they, you're free to uh, arrange insurance or um, uh, try to um, protect yourself and your family by any other mean. Here we have a, here's a list of the different types of inequalities that have been, been discussed in uh, this connection, namely this natural inequality would be, uh, examples of that would be disability of birth, at birth, socioeconomic inequality, parents, guardians, wealth, where you were born, talent inequality, that's intelligence, skills, employment prospects, preference inequality, it is uh, behavior, cultural prioritization of values uh, associated with the economic opportunities, your style, lifestyle, and then treatment inequality. That's discrimination in the job market and the education system. So um, these are uh, each of them have been um, uh, mentioned as um, uh, protected uh, attitudes. Here. I now I move into an example where all of these most of these principles have been discussed that is the principles for allocation 
of scarce resources on the um, uh, sorry um, healthcare resources on the scarcity conditions, and um, this actually came from a paper uh, before the COVID um, uh, crisis. It's from the Lancet, two thousand and nine, and I'm going to um, just uh, go through a few of these. I have it's perhaps a bit difficult to see, so I've split it up into two. So here, first we to look at these two groups of principles, namely treating people equally and then favoring the worst off. That would be equal opportunity. First, treating people equally. Here, yeah, one way of doing it would be lottery. This is actually being proposed by some. And the advantage is, this, as the authors mentioned, it's hard to corrupt, little information about recipients needed. And it ignores other the disadvantage is that it ignores, totally ignores, and, uh, oops, sorry, ignores uh, other relevant principles. Then there is this uh, first come, first serve principle, which certainly uh, protects existing doctor patient relationships, but, um, and it doesn't uh, require information about recipients, but it favors uh, those who have access first those who can afford it, those who have the resources and the means to get access, who are well connected. Then they uh, mentioned this other group, the favoring the worst off prioritization. Uh, it's also called prioritarianism. Here they have the, uh, those who are most deserving, the sickest first. Well, here we aid those who are suffering right now, and appeals to the rule of rescue. They uh, suggest that it has uh, disadvantages that uh, they call it surreptitious use of prognosis, ignores the need of those who will become sick in the future. So it is much too focused on who happened to be ill here now. So it might falsely assume temporary scarcity uh, and it leads to people receiving interventions only after prognosis deteriorates, they say. Um, the authors here uh, is Ezekiel uh, Emanuel, uh, a very well-known doctor from Chicago. I think he was the health czar of uh, Obama. And then a, a philosopher uh, is also among the uh, authors. Then they have another one, they favoring the worst off, the youngest first. Uh, benef and the advantage is that it benefits those who had the least life. Prudent planners have an interest in living to old age. So here they uh, mention as disadvantages, it's undesirable priority to infants over adolescents and young adults it ignores other relevant principles. So it is not that they say the principle is uh, no good, but it can't be the only one. Then let's look at the two other groups, maximizing total benefits, utilitarianism. Here yeah, it is, of course, that the number of lives saved uh, gives the advantage of actually benefiting the greatest number, avoids the need for comparative judgments. But it totally ignores other relevant principles. Then the... Uh, uh, another principle which does, which has, plays a great role, namely maximizing life years produced. Here they complain that it ignores other relevant principles, particularly distributive, distributive principles. And I think uh, what they are after here is that uh, uh, you cannot use this principle alone. Uh, then they, they, the last group is about promoting, promoting and rewarding social usefulness. Here they uh, mentioned instrumental value that helps, has the advantage of promoting other important values, future oriented. This is um, actually uh, has been discussed in the context of the COVID uh, crisis where the same authors have uh, discussed the um, prioritization of healthcare workers uh, for ventilators and for vaccination. 
and uh, I don't know how it is in India, but in Denmark, uh, healthcare workers were prioritized when we began uh, vaccination, as the uh, very older people were also. So here they complain that this is vulnerable to abuse, though choice of prioritized occupations or activities through choice of that. I can direct health resources away from health needs. Perhaps we can discuss this. Um, I mean, during the discussion, we mentioned this. I have some striking examples and striking contrasts between, for instance, Denmark and Germany, our neighboring country. Then they mentioned reciprocity rewards those who implemented important values. Oops, sorry. Uh, rewards those who implemented important values. Uh, that's, um, they say this is vulnerable uh, to abuse and can direct health sources away from health needs. Um, um, so these are uh, the, the principles that were discussed uh, and are being discussed also here during the COVID uh, triage uh, considerations. And um, I'm now going uh, to, um, as a way of summing up, mentioning mention that the trustworthy AI, uh, as it has been called, um, is a potential governance framework for um, handling uh, this, uh, for the process of handling uh, uh, biases and unfairness of machine learning and other uh, um, adverse effects of artificial intelligence and there's a lot of effort being put into this so for instance the uh, especially the european commission has been leading in this they have uh, issued a guideline that seeks to promote promote trustworthy ai and they mentioned it has to follow three principles it must be lawful ethical and robust and then they have seven they've actually issued seven requirements for trustworthy ai in this uh, report here that's the one down here which now is blown up and here they have the requirement about human agency and oversight requirement also about technical robustness privacy and data governance transparency explainability here we have it again diversity here again uh, again especially about the bias and fairness and then social and environmental well-being and finally accountability risk management this has um, engendered a lot of activity and research proposals and uh, they ha has also been accompanied by the european commission's, commission's first draft on the act of on ai which came out uh, last april so here they talk up they divide uh, ai um, systems into unacceptable risks high risks limited risks and low and minimal risks and in fact high risks ai systems including also many most uh, medical systems should be used as a safety component a product or a product falling under union health safety harmonization um and uh, this is an example of the research activity that european commission has initiated i was myself part of a consortium that uh, put in a bid for this let's see i think there's a lot of competition here this is a call for research project proposals in the, this field of trustworthy artificial intelligence tools to predict the risk of chronic non-communicable diseases and all that progression. Uh, I myself was involved in a similar governance framework for balancing respect for privacy and duty of care of vulnerable citizens. And here again, we had a, we call it a risk governance framework about how to identify, assess, manage, and communicate risks and uh, containing principles for transparency about how risks are dealt with, who decides, how to decide who is accountable. And then um, I may uh, mention uh, this is a, a very recent paper that came out last month it's, uh, from the Leiden University, where they also propose a uh, framework uh, for AI governance. Uh, 
time is running now, so I want to say thank you for your attention and I look forward to discussion with participants. Thank you, uh, Professor. It was a very, uh, very eye-opening talk, actually. Uh, biases in algorithms are now everywhere and uh, no one seems to care about that. Actually, the companies who are developing these algorithms should be more worried about that, but they do not show any interest. Mm -hmm. uh, as you rightly said, the biases, they can step into, uh, like from very beginning when the study starts, from the design, from the data collection, the entry, the model choice, and the implement of the results. Yeah. Prevention definitely is important. Uh, 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 I think you mentioned a lot. Uh, in, in 2019, there was a study which showed that uh, artificial intelligence biases had uh, uh, very great risk prediction algorithms which provided less quality care and, uh, and in predicting the prevalence of diseases in certain ethnic societies and uh, other incidences and the uh, predictors. Yeah. So, yeah. and actually it is in the sense because the risk of algorithm bias is much more because people are often uh, willing to trust in mathematical models because they believe that will remove the human bias whereas it is actually uh, going the reverse and the things are not very really transparent. Sorry, there's something scratching. Uh, maybe my one question to you is as you have uh, already covered that in your talk that uh, could there be a silver bullet about uh, how we can uh, prevent or mitigate uh, the algorithm biases uh, in the studies? Yeah, I don't think there's a silver bullet as such. There might, but there is a perhaps a silver process. And I think that's what they are suggesting in these, uh, this risk governance framework for for arranging it uh, so for instance here if i go back to this one this is one of the and looks very much like many of the others this is from the leiden group what they talk about the here uh, i'm showing it that uh, we have uh, six stages of uh, machine learning or AI. Um, uh, preparation. We have the data. I mean, and each of these stages, there are they are potential sources of uh, bias and unfairness. First, of course, here in the data preparation acquisition. Then we have the development of the algorithm and validation. And this is, for instance, one of the cases that uh, was surprising to me, or, or maybe it isn't. But that is that the patient mix really means a lot. Uh, so you can't just uh, you know transfer from one uh, hospital to the other. Then they then the this is the building that's the really computer science part of it, and uh, the medical part of it. And then we go to the governance framework. That's the interfaces, the embedding. It has to be embedded into a digital context uh, in a in a in a ecology of uh, service systems. We have to have the user system here. Again, we have problems of safety, privacy, confidentiality, transparency. And then we must look at this impact on stakeholder assessment. And finally, we go to the implementation. So I think that if we have, first of all, we must set about what do we need to achieve and what do we have to be, what are the, uh, I would say, what, what are the, uh, the, the type of unfairness that we don't want to have our algorithm produce? But Your, I think yes, yes, the possibility theorem simply says that you cannot have one single bullet. No, that's not. I think it, your your study and your lecture has been so intense that I would say that each word that have you have used is a chapter in itself. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, my yeah. one question is that uh, do we have some uh, monitoring committee or regulation or a formal legislation which can help the users guide? whether there has been any bias in the algorithm or not. Yeah, that's coming up now. So the, I think that would be of interest to you also because uh, the European Union uh, is actually, has been leading in this also, the, I don't know if you know, you're familiar with this GDPR. That's the, uh, you know, the, the regulations for privacy protection of your personal data. And uh, 
the US has been much more, I would say, libertarian, really. It has, you know, the big companies have really uh, bid in and have, uh, did, you know, delivered offers. And it's extremely inventive, very, very, very innovative. The European Union is a bit bureaucratic, but at, at least it tries to set up framework for regulating this. And um, I think it also offers uh, businesses an opportunity because they need they need assurance that they don't that they are not accountable for mishaps scandals. I'm working with businesses, and I know that uh, they are very very concerned that they don't uh, you know end up on the television news or newspapers or in court. Yes. So now my next question is that, see, if I talk about artificial intelligence, uh, we look at two aspects. One is the treatment aspects or the diagnostic aspects of use of uh, AI in healthcare. And second is certain mode of predictive healthcare. So these biases, they are more or less true for the prediction and uh, the analysis of those predictions. And there are no biases in the treatment or the diagnostic parts as such. Not necessarily. Like, Sorry. Uh, like I'll, I'll compete. Like uh, we do lots of uh, radiology reporting using AI. Now we are putting AI in uh, different diagnostic tests also. Would there be certain biases in those also? Because these reports are usually validated by the clinicians themselves. But eventually, over a period of time, this validation will also go off. Yeah. Yeah. I. I didn't. Uh, I'm. It's too long time ago I read this, but I mentioned I had one, this one called the biases in, uh, bu 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 bu, where was it? Um, that was uh, chest radiography. This has been mentioned also by our American colleagues. This is actually that dark skin actually precludes or uh, actually um, vitiates the pattern recognition of certain, you know, diseases. So even even such a trivial thing as dark or light skin, which uh, and certainly it must be in dermatology. Now I'm just trying to remember. So even in these areas, which I'm not really, I'm not very familiar with them. I'm just reading them as a, you know, as a journalist. <laughs> there, there I've seen uh, several examples of that. But it is especially in, uh, I would say, algorithms based on, you know, medical histories uh, where you, for instance, you know, they also mentioned like breast cancer. Breast cancer is mainly a women, a women's disease, but less than, a little less than 1% are males. And they are, they won't be caught by algorithms because that's the, the risk they have is so little. So therefore they will also be neglected okay so that means evil can creep both in the diagnostics and the prediction side and we yes. need to be careful enough about it. it is just the beginning of uh, where we can uh, caution ourselves and uh, take care and bend our ways to correct it as far as i understand yes uh thank you very much sir uh, i think there are no more uh, questions from the uh, from the participants and uh, i invite uh, dr lalu to make the final comments thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Henning and Dr. Naveen for that wonderful session. It's indeed an eye opener to me. A lot of things certainly flew above my head and a lot of interesting concepts I have learned as well. So it is very important for people like us to go in depth and understand the ethical aspects, the very basics of algorithms that are being used for AI. And really certainly I have learned a lot in this session. And I really appreciate you for taking your time and for presenting such a beautiful one in a very simple manner, I should say. Thank you very much uh, for your efforts. It's certainly a very difficult topic to make people understand. I really appreciate. Um, and I would request Dr. Ravindran Jagasothi to do the honors. Professor Emeritus, Dr. Henning Boy Anderson. It is an honor for me to present this virtual certificate to you uh, in, in memory of your lecture today. It was a very topical uh, lecture and I'm sure it has 
provoked a lot of thoughts in the KHO audience who are now trying to make research a top priority for themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm very honored. We take this opportunity to thank all of you who have joined from 17 countries across um, you know, the region and uh, other continents as well. And really thank Dr. Henning for the time, for the wonderful talk, and Dr. Naveen Chitkara for moderating the session. Thank you once again. Have a great evening and look forward to meeting you all very soon. Thank you.